Good morning. Good morning from London. Uh, my name's Stanley Burnton, as you can probably see, and I shall be chairing this webinar on uh, an important decision of the UK Supreme Court uh, on a very important question, namely the, the disqualification or qualification of arbitrators uh, through bias or apparent bias, very rarely actual bias that, that's suggested. So that's the Halliburton case, which we shall be discussing. It's a subject very close to my heart because 21 years ago, there was an attempt to disqualify a, uh, an arbitrator because one of the lawyers, a barrister uh, appearing in the arbitration was a member of his chambers. And the High Court held that the arbitrator was not disqualified. Um, I was that arbitrator. So let me introduce to you our very eminent panel. Um, from the UK, we have Hilary Halbron, Queen's Counsel from Brick Court Chambers. She has uh, accepted well in excess of 100 appointments in both institutional and ad hoc arbitrations. In addition, she had a long and distinguished career at the English Bar and is also a former member of the LCIA, London Court of International Arbitration Court, and of the ICC, UK Arbitration and ADR Committee. Gary Bourne, also from the UK, is chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Wilma Hale. He is widely recognized as one of the world's leading practitioners in international and commercial arbitration. He's the author of International Commercial Arbitration, one of the most comprehensive commentaries on the subject. In addition to his many other appointments, he is currently president of the Court of Arbitration of the Singapore International Arbitration Center. Tony Diamond from the UK is co-chair of the Asia Arbitration Practice at Deborah Voice and Plimpton, practicing from that firm's offices in London and in Hong Kong, and specializing in disputes arising from large scale energy and infrastructure projects. From far France, we have Bart Legum, global co-chair of the litigation and dispute resolution practice at Denton's. He has more than 30 years experience in arbitration and litigation and is the editor of the Investment Treaty Arbitration Review and was earlier in his career chief of the NAFTA Arbitration Division within the US State Department. From India, Gopal Subramaniam is a highly distinguished, mm -hmm. is a highly distinguished Indian lawyer who served as India's Solicitor General between 2009 and 2011. As counsel, he has acted in several landmark arbitration cases before the Indian courts. He's also acted as an arbitrator and as an expert witness on Indian arbitration law before several international tribunals. From Russia, we have Dmitry Diakin, head of the arbitration practice at Rubalkin, Rubalkin Gotsunyan and Partners. He leads both the ICC Arbitration Commission in Russia and also the Russian Arbitration Association Investment Arbitration Working Group. Sara Aranjo is a senior dispute resolution lawyer based at the Dubai office of Al Tamimi and Company. Sara regularly advises and represents clients in arbitration and arbitration related court proceedings, including the recognition enforcement and the setting aside of proceedings. She's an adjunct professor of law at the Université Paris II Pontéon Assas. From the United States, Robert DeBee is the chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Colin Wood. He has practiced in both common law and civil law jurisdictions and has successfully acted for clients across the world. His experience of high value international and commercial arbitration is extensive, having acted on disputes under LCIA, ICC, AAA and UNCITRAL rules. Now, I want to thank very much Kawa Qureshi for having organized this webinar. I'm going to ask him now to uh, introduce the subject, uh, following which we shall be putting questions relating to the Halliburton case to each of our eminent panelists. Kawa. Uh, 
you're on mute. Kawa, you're on mute. You're on mute. The My apologies for that. Let's start again. Uh, good morning from England. I'd like to begin by thanking Sir Stanley for very kindly chairing this uh, webinar. We have close to 300 attendees. And as her, Sir Stanley has kindly introduced all of the panelists, we have a very broad cross section of arbitration practitioners with a vast depth and breadth of experience. The issue that we're about to discuss concerns a fundamental aspect of arbitration, namely trust in the integrity of the process. We're speaking about a Supreme Court decision from the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom has for decades been a preeminent center for international arbitration, not least because of the trust in the institutional framework and the integrity, not just of the judiciary that supervises the arbitral process and enforces the awards, but also trust in the arbitral community in London. That trust in recent years has had to be articulated in rules. And as a consequence in both the ICC, LCIA, SIAC, AAA, in all of the institutions, there is a requirement for disclosure on the part of arbitrators of facts and circumstances they may, might, are likely to in the eyes of the parties or otherwise justifiably give rise to doubts as to impartiality. So far as English law is concerned, the Arbitration Act 1996 in three sections enshrines the duty of impartiality and the requirement of fairness, sections one, sections 33 and section 24. Section 24 entitles a party to apply to the court for the removal of an arbitrator in, where, in circumstances where there is in existence a justifiable doubt as to the arbitrator's impartiality. As Stanley has pointed out, uh, there was a case in 1999 uh, dealt with by Mr. Justice Ricks, as he then was, Laker Airways versus FLS in April 99, where there was an attempt to uh, remove Sir Stanley from an arbitral tribunal on the basis that an individual who was appearing for FLS, the barrister, had moved chambers. This is after the reference had begun. Whilst Laker didn't continue to participate and the application was dismissed, Mr. Justice Ricks provided very helpful observations, not least on the position of barristers and arbitrators from the same chambers and also the nature of the test justifiable doubts being an objective test. Now, since then, we've had around 40 uh, reported decisions from the English courts dealing with section 24 of the Arbitration Act. And a very recent decision of 2016 in the case of Coffley and Bingham is a case of, of note because in that case, Mr. Justice Hamblin, as he then was, who went on to give the judgment of the Court of Appeal in the Halliburton case and is now in the Supreme Court, uh, reviewed the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators rules and also the IBA guidelines to conclude that the arbitrator in that case, Mr. Coffley, who in Terralia had derived 18% of his appointments and 25% of his income in the past three years from the defendant party had created grounds, objectively speaking, which entitled or justified his removal. Now in that case, what was interesting was that the judge had regard to the IBA guidelines, particularly general guidance 3A, and also the orange list, specifically paragraph 315, where the arbitrator ought, out of an abundance of caution, disclose his or her uh, involvement in an arbitration in the past three years or uh, subsequent to appointment, where there is a common party. So we've got a reflection within our own uh, case law of an acceptance of the application of the uh, IBA guidelines and the orange list. And if you want to see that, that's at paragraph 79 to 81 and para 109 of Mr. Justice Hamblin's decision. Now, in 
the present case, the facts are uh, rather complex in some respects. We have a 22 page judgment of the Court of Appeal and then that triples in size by the time we get to the Supreme Court at 61 pages. But the background is as follows. In 1992, Halliburton and Chubb's predecessors had entered into a Bermuda form liability policy. That's subject to new law. There's an ad hoc arbitration tribunal uh, clause stipulates a th three person tribunal uh, for the commercial court to choose the chairman in the absence of agreement of the party appointed arbitrators. There was an incident the explosion on the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig on the 20th of April led to claims that rig was owned by Transocean, leased by BP, and Halliburton had provided some cementing and well monitoring services. Transocean also held a, a Bermuda form insurance policy with Chubb. The damage occurred in April 2010. There were various claims brought by the state pursuant to environmental uh, legislation, civil liability legislation, and the claims were settled in September 2014. The issue that arose, not just for Halliburton, but also Transocean, was whether the settlements were reasonable. Chubb had refused to pay, disputing the reasonableness of the settlements. We move on, therefore, to the arbitrations, and there are three that are relevant. Arbitration one, the arbitration that Halliburton were concerned with, they invoked the arbitration clause under the policy, and both the parties appointed US arbitrators. What? They were unable to agree on the chairman on the 12th of June, 2015, Mr. Justice Flo, as he then was, appointed Kenneth Ruckerson, who had been appointed by Chubb as uh, their nominee for chair, but had been objected to by Halliburton. It's important to note that the objection that Halliburton had raised related to the qualifications of the chairman, this being a matter subject to New York law, the argument was that the chair ought to be New York law qualified, which Ken Rockison and English QC was not. There was no other objection raised and Halliburton did not appeal against Mr. Justice Flo's decision uh, rendered pursuant to section 18 of the Arbitration Act 1996. Now at the time, Mr. Rockison disclosed the fact that he had been appointed in arbitrations by Chubb in the past and that he'd presently been appointed at the time of his appointment in arbitration one in two ongoing arbitrations by Chubb. So far, so good in terms of duty of disclosure. When did the problem start to arise? Transocean had also brought a claim against uh, Chubb under their policy, excess liability policy, which had been disputed by Chubb. And in December 2015, Chubb, using the same solicitors as had been acting in arbitration one, and the, the same uh, individual within Chubb who was dealing with arbitration one nominated Mr. Rockison QC as their party appointed nominator. Now I say Mr. Rockison QC because at first instance and uh, subsequently Mr. Rockison's name was withheld on the basis of the starting point in arbitration that as much information as possible ought to be kept confidential unless it's in the public interest to disclose it. Now, there came a point no doubt where it became apparent that it was necessary to provide full transparency so far as the Supreme Court was concerned, and Mr. Rockison's identity was disclosed. In December uh, 2015, Chubb nominated Mr. Rockison as their party appointed arbitrator. Now, Mr. Rockison disclosed this, uh, disclosed to Transocean, the fact that he'd been appointed in arbitration one, but apparently through oversight, did not disclose to Halliburton that he'd been appointed or his appointment was proposed in arbitration two. He accepted that appointment. Uh, of course, the fundamental uh, principle so far as disclosure is concerned is to provide a party with an opportunity to object and to ensure that there is transparency to avoid mistrust. Soon thereafter, in August, 2016, Mr. Rockison accepted another appointment, a joint nomination as a substitute arbitrator in a matter that involved Transocean and another insurer, but relating to the same uh, factual background. Apparently on the 10th of November, purely by chance, Halliburton discovered Mr. Rockison's appointment in arbitrations one, uh, two and three, shortly before an evidentiary hearing in arbitration one. And there then ensued correspondence on the 29th of November, 2016, Halliburton's lawyers, K. N. L. Gates wrote to Mr. Rockison, 
He replied back on the 5th of December 2016, uh, contending that there was no basis to contend that he ought to uh, withdraw, that he ought to resign. This was followed up by further communication where he uh, took the view that the IBA guidelines didn't apply. And that led on the 21st of December to an application pursuant to Section 24 of the Arbitration Act. Now, one of the points of interest here is the time at which the question of justifiable doubts as to impartiality ought to be considered by the objective uh, observer. Is it at the time the application was made or at the time of the hearing? Because when we get to the 3rd of February 2017, Mr. Justice Popperwell dismissed the challenge granting permission to appeal entirely on the grounds that A, the fact that there was a repeat appointment uh, context itself didn't give rise to any uh, grounds to seek or, or, or in, uh, appearance advice. And moreover, the individual in question was a highly experienced, highly regarded arbitrator who could be trusted to act impartially. The matter then proceeded to the Court of Appeal on, in April 2018. But in the interim, uh, two points of interest. Firstly, in January 2017, Halliburton had asked Mr. Rockerson whether he was aware of there being any common issues between the arbitration they were involved in, as against uh, Chubb, and the arbitration that, Hall uh, that Transition were involved in. Mr. Rockerson didn't reply, but on the 10th of January, Halliburton managed to obtain the pleadings from Chubb in the second matter, which had involved Transocean. And it became apparent from those pleadings that in substance, the issues were the same. There was a, a contention on the part of Chubb that the settlement was not reasonable. And there was a preliminary issue that needed to be dealt with both in references two and three. And ultimately it transpired that after Mr. Jo Justice Popperwell had dismissed Halliburton's challenge in March, references two and three were both uh, dismissed by way of a preliminary issue. Now that is perhaps happenstance because when Halliburton raised the challenge in uh, December of 2016, they were not aware and nor could the arbitrator have been aware that a preliminary issue would be determined not just of reference two, but also of reference three. And the fact that the arbitrator didn't respond with regards to the query as to the commonality of references one and references two, no doubt from Halliburton's perspective, was troubling. In April 2018, Lord Justice Hamblin, giving the, the, the judgment of the Court of Appeal, dismissed Halliburton's appeal, whilst concluding that Mr. Rockison ought to have disclosed his appointment in arbitrations two and three, mere non-disclosure without more was not sufficient to give rise to an inference of apparent bias. The appeal uh, was heard by the Supreme Court in November 2019. There was a delay of about a year before judgment was handed down for whatever reason. But otherwise the matter proceeded relatively swiftly before our courts. The ICC and LCI intervened with oral and written submissions. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the LMA and GAFTA intervened by way of written submissions to provide the court with greater context as to international practice and the practice of particular institutional arbitrations. Now the Supreme Court's judgment, uh, in summary, it's a 61 page judgment, majority view reflected in the judgment of Lord Hodge, Mary, uh, Lady Arden providing her own views from her perspective, being a specialist in, uh, in company law, Lord Hodge, Lord Reed, Lady Black, and Lord Lloyd Jones in the majority, Lord Hodge, Lord Reed, the Scottish uh, lawyers by background, uh, Lady Black, a family lawyer by background, and Lord Lloyd Jones, an academic from Cambridge. But in terms of the judgment, <laughs> the, the paragraphs, and I, that's just my way of background. The, the paragraphs of the judgment that I want to draw your attention to are from 145 onwards. And we're at 145, the Supreme Court concluded that Mr. Rockerson was under a legal duty to disclose his appointment in arbitration to, to, to Halliburton, because at the time of that appointment, the existence of potentially overlapping arbitrations with one common party was a circumstance which might reasonably give rise to the real possibility of bias. And moreover, at paragraph 147, his failure to make that disclosure was the breach of his legal duty, which would satisfy the real 
possibility of bias test. So the important point here is the confirmation that the legal duty to disclose. But of course, many in the arbitral community would say, well, Mr. Rockison having already concluded that it would have been prudent for him to disclose and the IBA uh, guidelines in the orange list making it clear that uh, uh, out of an abundance of caution, the arbitrator ought to disclose the acceptance of a legal duty was a, a matter that perhaps was helpful from the Supreme Court's perspective, but in any event, that was commonly understood by arbitrators. The caveat and the reason why there were no consequences for the arbitrator in terms of removal was that temporally, by the time of the Section 24 hearing, which took place in January 2017, the judgment of Mr. Justice Popple well, being handed down on the 3rd of February, mm -hmm. Mr. Rockison had explained what he described as an oversight, accepted by Halliburton as genuine, and furthermore, by that time, the references in arbitration two had come to an end. And on the facts, there were five points, according to uh, the Supreme Court, that justified Mr. Rockison's perspective and the conclusion that their fair-minded and informed observer would not infer there was a real possibility of bias on the part of Mr. Rockison, being, firstly, the lack of clarity in English law as to whether there was a legal duty of disclosure and whether disclosure was needed. Pausing there, reference to the orange list, I've already explained that in the case of Coffley and Bingham in 2016, Mr. Justice Hamblin had regard to the orange list as part of the necessary framework in concluding that Mr. Bingham uh, ought to be removed pursuant to Section 24. And international practice would indicate that there was plainly a duty of disclosure in the minds of many, if not most. The timing sequence of the three references, question that some of you may ask is, well, the fact that the second and third references came after the reference that where he was appointed by the uh, court is neither here nor there. There's a continuing duty of disclosure. His measured response to the challenge, well, the fact that he dis didn't descend into the arena ought not to be necessarily a reason uh, to militate against his removal, some of you may say, in contrast to Mr. Bingham, who decided to have a spat with the council who was questioning his standpoint. There's no question of Mr. Rockison having received any secret financial benefit. Again, some of you may say, if you are, if you are a repeat appointee, as Mr. Bingham was, deriving 25% of his income from one party. In this case, where Mr. Rockison had already been appointed by Chubb in two arbitrations that were ongoing, accepted appointment as chair in the one in June 2015 by the court, and then accepted a subsequent appointment at the behest of Chubb's lawyers, who were also the lawyers in the Halliburton Chubb case. That's four arbitrations. Uh, there is an element of income being derived from one party in is that or is that not uh, an issue of concern? And there was no suggestion of unconscious bias in the form of subconscious ill will in response to the robustness of the challenge. Now that's the judgment. Where does that leave us? There are three questions that the panelists will uh, address, which uh, Sir Stanley will uh, ask them to address in turn so that we can get an insight from the international arbitral community about whether or not this decision provides necessary and sufficient uh, clarity as to the scope and existence of a duty of disclosure, whether the distinguished panel members agree with the outcome of the case, if not, what's the impact of this likely to be on London's position, and should institutions be reviewing their rules in the right of the Supreme Court's decision? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kawa. Um, I take it that I can be heard. So I'm going to ask uh, the panel individually to address each of the questions. We'll start with question one, which you've just seen. Does the decision provide necessary and sufficient clarity as to the existence and scope of an arbitrator's duty of disclosure? Um, Hilary, what's your view of these extremely long judgments? She's muted. Hilary, you're muted. Sorry about that. I think the judgments, insofar as it was necessary, provide clarity at the highest level of three things. One, the existence of a legal duty to disclose. Two, the welcome clarification that there's no difference whether you're a party appointed arbitrator or a chair. Uh, and thirdly, 
uh, emphasizes uh, the difference between uh, the duty to disclose and whether at the end of the day, depending on the facts, there is actually an appearance of bias or a conflict of some sort. But the problem I fear with the case is it was decided on pretty narrow facts uh, and therefore hasn't dealt with all uh, the potential issues in relation to the scope of disclosure. Uh, in that case, the arbitrator was taken to have known of the position. Uh, and uh, obviously in the Supreme Court, they took the English view that one looks at these things from an objective perspective. Uh, but one has to then look at the situation where you've got like the LCIA rules or the ICC rules, where the position is a subjective one. Uh, and that leaves aside the IBA rules, which were held not to have direct relevance and no legal underpinning. So that it does leave a potential to use the phrase in the uh, different sense, conflict between uh, the cases where there's rules which are held, which apply in England, which are held in England uh, and ad hoc uh, cases where there are no rules to uh, determine what has to be disclosed. Uh, it's also left open the issue of what happens where you perhaps didn't know, but ought to have known, such as if you're an international firm of lawyers checking in your database to see whether one of the parties is a client of the firm. Uh, and then the other matter, which it still hasn't dealt with, uh, although it, it did allude to it, is the nature of the reasonable inquiries that one has to undertake uh, for the purpose of uh, determining whether or not you should disclose. So very briefly, those are my uh, initial views. Thank you very much. Gary, can you hear yeah, me? As, as well, it, it's interesting to compare this judgment to judgments in, in other cases, for example, Fiona Trust, where you have a, a fairly pithily stated rule that then I think gets followed in other jurisdictions um, fairly, fairly readily. We'll see whether that happens with, with this judgment. With respect to the existence of a duty to disclose, I think the judgment's rather clear there is such a duty, it's a continuing duty. With respect <clears throat> to the scope of the judgment, I think things are, are left a little bit grayer around the edges, if I can put it that way. How exactly the duty applies in different contexts, whether it's commodities and maritime on the one hand or traditional international commercial arbitration, I think is unclear. I think there's some suggestion that in specialized fields, specialized rules may, may apply. Naturally, the decision by the Supreme Court recognizing at that level for the first time a duty of disclosure even when the, the, act, the 1996 Act deliberately chose not to do so is, is of guidance as to, to the existence of, of a duty and the exact scope of that duty remains to be worked out by, by lower courts. How exactly the IBA guidelines will, will play out in that, in that working out of, of the duty, I think remains to be seen. So I guess I would, I, I would say that this is a good start, but only a start. Thank you very much. Tony Diamond. Um, well, I, I, I'd agree with everything that's been said uh, uh, thus far. Um, uh, obviously, it's a step forward to have uh, it recognized that there's a legal duty to disclose. Um, I agree that um, uh, we need some further clarification of the extent of the duty to investigate. Uh, and I agree with Gary that, that probably the biggest area of uncertainty at the moment is the uncertainty around um, uh, uh, the, the uh, specific uh, types of arbitration to which the duty does, does or does not attach. And, you know, I, here the court's reliance on, you know, custom and practice in relevant uh, arbitration fields, I, I think that leaves some significant uncertainty. Um, so, you know, just to take a couple of examples, suppose you have a, a you know, a, a large offshore oil drink construction dispute between a Brazilian shipbuilder and, uh, and an international oil company, which is LMAA. Um, is that going to be uh, uh, subject to uh, the, the uh, custom and practice of LMAA uh, uh, rules, or is it going to be subject to the usual 
uh, standards of disclosure expected in international arbitration. Uh, and, and more broadly, I mean, in, in my field, which is mainly infrastructure disputes, you know, that, that's an area where you, you, you might expect to see lots of overlapping arbitrations because, you know, they're large projects, they're uh, complex uh, contractual networks, long supply chains, etc. But I, I, for whatever reason, I don't think that there is a custom and practice of arbitrators sitting on overlapping cases, certainly not without disclosure. And I would be very anxious uh, if we were to see it suggested uh, that arbitrators in, in, in construction disputes didn't have that, that kind of duty of disclosure. Um, the, the one thing that hasn't been mentioned so far, uh, which I think is, a, is, a, is also a big positive coming out of the judgment is the, um, the, the reconciling of the duty to disclose with possibly competing um, uh, uh, obligations of confidentiality. And I, I think the court was very robust on that. Uh, and uh, you know, it makes the point that you know, usually it will be permissible uh, to provide a high level disclosure of the common party in overlapping arbitrations and, and something about the related uh, uh, subject matter. And the court goes on to say that if more disclosure is reasonably required and, and the arbitrator can't get permission to make that disclosure, well, that's an end of it. He can't take the appointment. And, and that, I think, has got to be the right result. And, and that's a welcome clarification. Thank you very much indeed. But Bart Legum? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would not expect from any one decision to have a comprehensive statement of the duty of disclosure in international arbitration. Um, for this decision, from an international practitioner's perspective, putting the cursor on a fair and objective observer, as opposed to uh, the perspective of the parties, is not particularly helpful because at least uh, to my mind, a fair and objective observer when decided by a court in England is going to be an English judge. And for parties, counsel and arbitrators who've never had the pleasure of appearing before an English judge, uh, assessing how an English judge might decide a fair and impartial observer uh, would approach the question of disclosure is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, so the, the emphasis on the objective approach as opposed to looking at the eyes of the parties um, is something that is out of line with international practice and, and, and not particularly helpful. Thank you. Uh, Gopal. Thank you, Sir Stanley. It's a pleasure to speak about this judgment. Uh, I have to say with some reluctance that uh, it does not provide necessary and sufficient clarity on the issue. And I say so with some respect. Uh, Section 33 of the Act is a statutory description of what an arbitrator is expected to be. And Lord Hodge is absolutely right when he says that Section 33 does contain a certain tryst with the duty of disclosure, because it is a facet of impartiality. But I find at the same time he migrates to the duty of disclosure of being a waivable term in a contract. And I find that very, very inconsistent, because what is statutorily described is very different from what a term in a contract can be to waive the obligation of disclosure. It is one thing that somebody may waive an objection after disclosure, but it is entirely different, I think, from treating this as a waivable obligation in a contract. The second uh, problem which I have is that the judgment has referred to the IBA rules as guidelines at one place, but heavily drawn upon them and has used the commentaries on general standards two and three. But more importantly, I notice that there are two extraneous lines of thought which have entered the judgment. The first is, what is the difference between judges and arbitrators? I do not see this as relevant in my view for the purpose of determining whether there was in fact 
justifiable doubts about impartiality. The second is, I also find that the uh, discussion relating to third party appointed arbitrators is again somewhat irrelevant, except that uh, at some place, it seems to suggest that this is a case where there were two wrongs, because in para 142, the judge observes that Halliburton's uh, arbitrator also did not disclose about his previous appointments, but two wrongs never make a right. So with respect, I would say that while the duty to disclose is indeed a very well-known and well-accepted institutional facet of impartiality in all leading international arbitration institutions. And we have the SIAC precedent here. SIAC is one of the best institutions which has signified this robustness. But alongside, I'm extremely happy to note how the London institutions went into the case and actually said that this is an obligation per se. That's my view. Thank you very much indeed. Dimitri, what is the Russian view? Yeah, um, thank you, sir. I, I agree, I tend to agree with uh, much uh, what have been said by Tony, Gary and Hillary. Um, and it's clear that uh, Supreme Court made completely clear that there is a continuing legal duty of this court under English law. Uh, what, is left un uh, what is left unclear, uh, uh, it is unclear uh, to me as well, uh, is the scope of this duty. And there are several points to note in this regard. First, uh, Supreme Court indeed reaffirmed the objective rather than subjective standard regarding the scope of disclosure. And this, is, um, this differs from institutional uh, approach and also from IBA guidelines that refer to possible bias and bias of the parties. And this is um, quite low, uh, much lower test as opposed to the institutions. Second, in terms of what must be disclosed, the Supreme Court restated the course of uh, appeals formulation of the duty uh, of disclosure as extended to matters known to the arbitrators. However, the court didn't rule out the possibility when an arbitrator would be under duty to make reasonable inquiries. That's interesting, in order to comply with such a duty. And this is um, not clear, uh, no clarity in this respect. Third, the Supreme Court ruled that duty to disclose doesn't supersede an arbitrator's duty to preserve con confidentiality under English law. So it is unclear uh, what are the boundaries of this, uh, this obligation of privacy and confidentiality. Fourth, the court ruled that the prospective arbitrator must obtain the consent of the parties before making a disclosure for confidential, uh, of confidential information. Here, the problem may arise when the prospective arbitrator was not given a consent to disclose confidential information. So what could be disclosed uh, in this case? And would the arbitrator's failure to disclose be considered as a breach of his uh, or her legal duty? And finally, Supreme Court itself admitted that there is no single test to be applied in determining, determining the precise scope of duty of disclosure in different fields. And here the difference in um, shipping, agriculture, uh, commodities, construction, etc. So for our, such institution as ICC and LSA, the existence of related arbitration with a common party can give a rise to justifiable doubts. But this might be not the case for force for GAFT arbitration. So uh, the, 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 the conclusion here that the scope of um, disclosure may, uh, may um, likely depend on the custom and practice in different fields. Thank you very much. Uh, Sara, Thank you, Sir Sally. Thank you, Sir Sally. I'll, uh, I pretty much concur with what was shared earlier, but um, allow me maybe just to um, provide maybe a Middle Eastern perspective or touch to it, is that indeed this is a very welcome judgment from a perspective that it has set out in a clear manner, the duty of disclosure for English seated arbitrations. And, and this is indeed very welcome. Um, so maybe to, to, to answer the question that was posed, which is does the decision provide necessary and sufficient clarity as to the existence um, of the duty of disclosure? The, the answer is obviously yes. And this is a very noteworthy, I would say, 
contribution of that specific judgment. But, but to answer maybe the second subpart of the question, which is, does it provide a necessary and sufficient clarity with respect to the scope of such a duty? And I, I would have to, to agree with what uh, my, my colleagues, fellow panelists said, which is unfortunately no, it falls short on this. And, and while the standard has been obviously established as an, an objective, and I quote, fair-minded and informed observer, and this is pretty much tied up also to the position of the UAE courts here in, in the UAE, which is also an objective standard, which is pretty much premised on the standard of bon père de famille, which we often find in French courts. But unfortunately, what is really that scope and to, to, to which elements the framework of such a scope of a duty, unfortunately, remains to be um, defined. And this is often, I think, related to that malleable nature of uh, the, the disclosure and what it entails. And, and, and I would like to echo what was said earlier, is that this is a very, um, this is obviously an ongoing duty. There's an ongoing duty of disclosure. Not only does it manifest itself at the outset of the proceedings, at the, at the cardinal time of the constitution of the tribunal, but also throughout the proceedings up until the discharge of the mandate of, of the arbitrators. But nevertheless, it is quite important in my view to note as well that what does it entail? And, and, and given the malleable nature of such a duty and its scope, what will happen is often, it is often subject to social and legal evolution. And one example which, which comes to mind, which is maybe in 10 years ago, uh, maybe uh, issues of maybe uh, social, um, uh, social media, that were pretty much inexistent or not commonly used. But today, with an arbitrator liking, for example, a post of another lawyer create a situation of bias, etc. So this is indeed welcome, but I would definitely feel that the judgment would merit further clarity in terms of the, I would say, latter part of the question, which is the scope of such a duty. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Robert, Robert B. Yeah, it's always useful and helpful to get sort of the, the high level view of what the scope is and what the duty is. And indeed, uh, the, the conclusion that the duty was breached here. Where it gets, in my mind, truly problematic is when the focus then shifts towards what the consequences should be. And in particular, when in that context, the focus shifts towards the blame, i.e. did the arbitrator have any blame that he maybe do this as a mistake. And the issue I have with that is that whether or not one creates the appearance of bias is not necessarily related to that issue at all. I would say in many instances it's irrelevant. One could very well create the appearance of bias while making a mistake. And, and I, I gladly grant Mr. Rokinson that, that, that uh, conclusion that the court follows. But it does, it's not helpful to focus on that because first of all, it plays into the idea that challenging uh, the arbitrator somehow should be taken as a personal affront. And, and, and sort of amazingly, we see the court below slamming Halliburton for having been offensive, which is a bit rich if the conclusion is that indeed the arbitrator violated the duty. And, and to make matters worse, then the focus comes on to blame and it's sort of the emphasis of blame becomes sort of a disculpating fact. The reality of course, is that most arbitrators do not intentionally or purposefully create an appearance of bias. I would think that is very, very rare if it exists at all. So most of these cases are going to concern mistakes and everybody makes mistakes that's human. But to say that there should be no consequences to making a mistake, I think does not in a prophylactic sense, in my mind, send the right message, nor do I think it's the right measure. And if the consequence of bringing that sort of a violation to the attention of the court and having to litigate it is that the party who brings to the attention of the court not only gets slammed for having done so by the court, but then loses it all the way through because 
blame somehow becomes an issue in the sense that, well, if you don't do it on purpose, then we kind of conclude there are no consequences. Then I think that's rather problematic. Um, I think it will, the judgment, unfortunately, I think will send a signal to most people that given that arbitrators don't intentionally do these sort of things, create the appearance bias, that it's a very dangerous and probably unwise thing to challenge it to the court, not only because it may be money wasted, you may wind up with an order for cost to the other side, but in the process of having brought to the attention of the court what is a violation of a duty, you then get, as thanks for all that effort, a verbal bollocking saying that it was offensive. And I, I don't think that is the message we want to send when it comes to a sensitive issue like this. Thank you very much indeed. That leads, leads very nicely to the second question, which I'm going to ask each of the panelists, which is whether they agree with the results of this, of, of the appeal. And if they don't agree, uh, will it affect the standing uh, of London as a, what it has been so far, the preeminent arbitral seat for international arbitration. So can we go, can we start again with, with Hillary? I, I already, I think, detect certain differences between the members of the panel. Let's see what happens. You're muted. I'm going to start with the um, second part of the question first. Uh, and that is, is it going to affect London's position? And I think the answer to that is, is, is clear in this sense. It is all going to depend on how the courts interpret it on the facts of particular cases. Because as I said at the outset, this is really quite a narrow case. It's dealing with multi-party appointments in a situation where the arbitrator knew what the position was. Uh, and as other panelists have said, we've got to see how this evolves. So apart from the clarity points, which we've mentioned, um, I don't think you can uh, take a final view uh, long term. Uh, but at the moment, I don't think it does adversely affect London's position for the narrow uh, issues that it deals with. Uh, so far as agreeing with the outcome of the case, um, without going specifically to the facts, I do have a little concern about the timing of this, which is really picking up on Robert's point, because you could, I suppose, in theory, have two different situations. Uh, moving away from the facts of this particular case, you could have a challenge made to an institution uh, at a certain time where the facts are A and a conclusion is reached. And then further down the line, there's an application to the English court at a different time when something has happened uh, and a different situation has arisen. So um, I, I think there is a little bit of a, a problem with the timing. Um, and of course, in this case, it was a long way down the line in the end because of the uh, Supreme Court judgment. But the relevant time is the time it goes to the uh, court I, at, at first instance. So I do have a little concern about that. Uh, and I also take Robert's point that it is obviously the judge is looking at it from a distance. Uh, and one can see why on the facts of this case they concluded as they did. But whether uh, it, it, the facts of a particular case sometimes make uh, difficult law, uh, again, I think the jury's out. Thank you very much. Um, Gary, what's your view? Thanks so much. I, I'd like to start um, by going back to the, the duty of disclosure and putting in a good word, if I can, for how the court treated the duty of disclosure as an objective matter. I think what some institutions, the ICC in particular, the IBA guidelines have done by looking to a subjective test in the eyes of the parties is, is wrongheaded. I think the, the Supreme Court's focus on an objective observer, but looking to the specific context that observer is in, is for example, maritime and commodities versus normal commercial arbitration is actually a quite sensible, workable and appropriate approach. I think it's <coughs> impossible in fact, for 
an arbitrator to put themselves into the shoes of particular parties. And I think an objective test, whether by an English judge or otherwise, looking to, to a, an objective observer in the, the arbitration community is both sensible and, and workable. I think in part for that, I agree with Hillary that the judgment will um, protect London's position as an international arbitration center. I, I think that is a position that's under significant challenge from places like Singapore and elsewhere and clarifying the existence of a duty, a continuing duty to disclose is an important step in, in the right direction. I do think, however, that there are additional steps that need to be taken and need to be taken carefully. Like Hillary, I'm quite skeptical about the court's conclusion that the appropriate time and the only time that one looks to whether or not there are justifiable doubts as to impartiality and independence for purposes of removal is at the time of the hearing. Certainly one wants to take into account the facts that are available then. But I think if one were to conclude that a particular arbitrator in fact was subject to those doubts at any time, whether at the time of challenge or otherwise, it would ordinarily be the case that that arbitrator ought to be removed. I don't want to go unnecessarily into metaphors, but once having been tainted, I think it's quite difficult to imagine that an arbitrator properly can become untainted. And I think that there is in fact no need to pick only one time for assessing the arbitrator's independence and impartiality. And London, the international arbitration community would have been better served by a rule that looked to any applicable time. Thank you very much. Tony Diamond. Thank you. Um, well, I find myself in violent agreement with uh, all that's been said so far. Um, I, I don't think it will affect London's position. Um, uh, you know, first, you know, the vast majority of international arbitrations which take place in London take place under the aegis of, uh, of uh, institutions such as the ICC or LCIA and uh, obviously um, the first port of call usually for disqualifications uh, is to the um, is to the institutions themselves. I, I suspect um, that in the instant case, if it had been under the aegis of the ICC or LCIA, th those bodies would have reached a different conclusion. And so, just on that narrow basis, I don't think uh, uh, London will be affected. I also think that there are lots of positives um, that, that come out of the decision, uh, which have already been discussed, and so. On balance, I think it probably reinforces uh, London as an important um, and leading uh, seat. Uh, on the issue of whether or not uh, the decision was the right one, uh, I, I uh, agree with what has been suggested uh, uh, in, by previous speakers. I, I don't think it was. Um, so, so, I mean, I think the point taken by both the Court of Appeal and, and the Supreme Court was that any possible concerns arising from the overlapping arbitrations had evaporated by the time of the hearing because those other arbitrations weren't going anywhere, and um, uh, uh, and so so that issue was disposed of. But but of course that doesn't negative the breach of the duty to disclose. And and here I I, I really felt that the court gave too much weight to the arbitrator's explanation for that non-disclosure. Yeah, you know he'd been appointed by Chubb in two previous arbitrations. His appointment in this one had been resisted by Halliburton. He'd recognized that he needed to disclose um, a, in arbitration two, his appointment in arbitration one, but he failed to do the same in arbitration one. And I think most people would feel that that fact pattern raised justifiable doubts, notwithstanding his uncontested explanation for that admission. And, and I think, I fear, that too much deference may have been given to um, the professional reputation and experience of this particular arbitrator, which the court identifies as a material consideration. And, and, and that in itself is a concern. I think it, it, it appears to result in new players being held to higher standards than established practitioners. And uh, ultimately, it kind of reinforces a perception that arbitrators are drawn from a members only club. And, and I don't think that's, uh, I think that's potentially damaging for the community.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, Bart, Bart Legum. Thank you. Well, I, I fully agree with, with what Tony has just said. Uh, on the merits from the perspective of an international arbitration practitioner, it's very difficult to understand how the court came to the conclusion that it did. Uh, first, it's surprising that a presiding arbitrator would accept an appointment by one of the parties in the case before him in a related case. And it is incomprehensible that an arbitrator would uh, not only accept such an appointment, but fail to disclose it. Uh, so at least from, from my perspective, that is far below the standard that one would expect in international arbitrations from a presiding arbitrator. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's, it's very difficult to understand the court's decision on, on the merits of the case. Um, and, and certainly simply saying that you're sorry, um, yes, that's helpful, but, but what is it exactly that a legal duty to disclose entails if simply by saying you're sorry uh, makes the problem go away. Um, in terms of its effect on London's place as a preeminent center of international arbitration, uh, for the reasons that have been explained, I don't think it will have much of an impact because uh, most of the arbitrations that are conducted are conducted under rules that, uh, that provide for stricter standards than uh, what the court has adopted. Uh, so that concludes my remarks, and I also extend my apologies. I have an airplane to catch, so I'll be signing off after this. Thank you. So um, you're pointing to a discrepancy between our, law, our general law and arbitral institutional rules. C correct. And, and obviously, if, if the arbitral institution rules have a stricter standard in terms of arbitrator disclosure and disqualification, then the institution which administers those rules and decides on challenges uh, will be the more relevant uh, reference point of course. on this issue. Yeah, thank you very much. Gopal, can I ask you your views? Well, I'm going to be very consistent in the answer to the second question. I do not agree with the outcome of the case, to put it very mildly. Uh, the previous panelist raised two points. One was, should there have been an appointment? Should the chairman have taken a second appointment? And I think it's a very valid point which he has raised because the judgment contains intrinsic evidence that the court ought to have actually taken up that point. In para 142 of the judgment, Lord Hodge refers with approval the judgment of Justice Leggett in LLC versus Swiss, where in fact, multiple appointments was actually discouraged and the court refused to appoint a person in an arbitration because he had connection with the same subject matter earlier. Now there are two facets here. The appointment or taking another arbitration itself has not been seriously adverted to in the judgment. It has been only on the duty to disclose but on the duty to disclose, I find that if you measure up Paris 145 and 146, which speak about a compelling duty to disclose, but when you come to para 149 and you wish to apply this, I find that uh, the reasons which have been given don't measure up to the inviolable duty to disclose. If there is that failure, is that failure capable of an explanation? I'm afraid, no, because this is an institutional requirement. When we talk about integrity of arbitration, it is institutional, it's not simply personal in character. So the duty to disclose is an institutional requirement of integrity of the arbitral process, which even though it is private, carries with it the same degree of adjudicatory disposition. And the second point is in the five reasons which have been given, the first one that there is lack of clarity in English law till now, I'm afraid that may not be entirely accurate. I do see the previous judgments being very clear, including LLC versus Swiss. The second one, the time sequence in this case may explain 
why there was a need to disclose reference one to the next appointment, but not vice versa. I don't see the time sequence justifying this observation. The third one, which is about measured response. This, if I may say so with great respect, is again extraneous. We are assuming the best in favor of the arbitrator, but his explanation and his manner of adverting to what is put against him is really not of great consequence at all uh, in this matter. So the, the law, if it is that there is a duty to disclose and if there is a breach, the consequences in the absence of a waiver of an objection by Halliburton must be logical. And I do not see those logical consequences being satisfactorily accounted for. Now, the second part of the question, London is famous for three things, an absolutely independent judiciary, an absolutely independent legal profession, and also very importantly, one of the best and accomplished arbitral seats in the world. And one of the reasons why people have chosen English law and London as an arbitral seat is because of impartiality. And my concern is that if the duty to disclose even being held to be inviolable, but at the same time, you can actually get away with having breached the duty, I do not think it necessarily augurs well for London as an arbitral seat. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, I, again, I uh, tend to agree with much of uh, what um, uh, Bart and Tony said. Um, from my perspective, I, uh, frankly speaking, I, I, I would say that the outcome is um, uh, rather confusing and quite confusing. And from the Russian perspective, it seems that uh, the courts were trying to protect uh, not only London as a seat of arbitration, being a popular place for arbitration, but also arbitration community. No doubt that Mr. Rockison is a trustful and prominent, uh, prominent arbitrator, no doubt about that. And the courts uh, were trying to protect arbitration uh, community as such by different um, legal techniques. As you can see from the, from the uh, outcome of, uh, of all courts, all instances came to the same conclusion, but with different uh, reasoning and that's, uh, Strike me as a, as a, you know, as a, a bit. Uh, it seems like the the outcome was a bit predetermined. Mr. Justice Popolwell dismissed the application of Halliburton, finding that circumstances didn't, didn't give rise to any justifiable concerns of uh, Rockison and partiality, and hence there is nothing to disclose. The Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal, finding that. Uh, disclosure would have uh, been made, uh, to have been made, something more than mere non-disclosure was required to justify his challenge. And uh, finally, the Supreme Court forced the something more test uh, adopted by the Court of Appeal and applied an objective test to both disclosure and challenge. So and by applying the same test of the fair-minded and informed uh, observer, the uh, Supreme Court came to a surprising conclusion. On the one hand, the arbitrator should have disclosed a number of appointments, but on the other hand, there was no appearance of bias in those appointments and failed to disclose them. In other words, uh, if there's, there was no appearance of bias from the objective point of view, why the arbitrator would have been objectively required to disclose those appointments? This is completely unclear. So the Supreme Court tried to uh, reconcile this by referring to a number of factual circumstances. And uh, as uh, Hillary correctly noted in the beginning, the uh, factual circumstances of, the, of, of this case are quite, uh, um, quite narrow. So I believe that this approach would bring more, um, more questions than uh, answers in the, in the future. So, and uh, also it's interesting that um, if the courts could not uh, could not agree on the test which might be applied to this issue, that might also um, give a, give rise to the jurisdiction itself. Um, so that's uh, the view uh, from from here. 
although I, I see that London would continue uh, to be a very popular place for arbitration. Thank you very much. Sarah. I mean, one thing I notice when you read the judgment, that 61 page judgment, is that you could see the court adopting, I would say, a, a, an offensive and quite robust approach uh, to sort of save the, the arbitration. And this is pretty much, I would say, in line with, with the English court's attitude, which has been very pro arbitration, and which have undoubtedly contributed to making London such a popular seat globally. But, but what I pause myself is, has the court maybe taken a very absolute approach towards that? And, and the question in my view, in this particular case is yes, uh, I personally do not agree with, uh, with the outcome in this case, um, but, but when you read the reasoning of the court, you come to realize as to how the court has attempted quite vigorously uh, to protect uh, the arbitrator. In my view, potentially, and, and to touch upon what Kawar helpfully mentioned at the outset of the introductory remarks for, for today's discussion, is that we should always keep in mind that the duty of disclosure is correlated with the principle of integrity um, and sanctity of arbitral proceedings, which obviously is interlinked to uh, the credibility of arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism just as a whole. So when you read the judgment, you, you can feel that the court has tried so hard, and I think in my view, uh, went even overbroad to, to protect in this case, what to me is a protection of, of an arbitrator that itself ended up appointing before also in circumstances where also we look at the facts so even before the arbitrator in question was appointed in two subsequent arbitrations, he actually had made a disclosure at the time, at the time the courts thought to, to, to appoint him as part of the application before the courts for, his, for, for the appointment of the presiding arbitrator. He had disclosed in the past, and this is I find completely interesting, is that he had disclosed at the time that he was appointed in two preceding arbitrations as well by Chuck. So I, I, I do think that um, in this case, the, the court although quite helpfully did establish that legal duty for disclosure, but with respect to that scope of duty and specifically the issue of apparent bias, I, I do think that the court has pretty much, maybe the word is too strong, but missed the point that arbitration is a party's consensual right to, 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 to have its dispute resolved through that means and it's much more about protecting the parties and the integrity of the proceedings. But I felt that in this case, the, 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 the court was adopting a, a, a very absolute, quite aggressive approach to protecting its pro-arbitration stand, probably to the detriment of, of the parties and their equal right to, 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 to defense in the case. But it's, it's very also noteworthy to note that in doing so, the court also, and I quote, clearly stated that you know such challenges rarely succeed and in my view it's quite interesting that such challenges did not necessarily succeed under such instances and and also stated that maybe in reaching its decision and i'm quoting you know they're trying to deter what and, and i quote parties that will be alive to the possibility and i quote opportunistic and tactical challenges did the court go too overbroad in my view that's the case but as um Hillary um, indicated, and I fully concur, I, I think we would have to see um, further outcomes before we can tell whether this is ultimately gonna have an impact, if any, on London's um, uh, position as, as a preeminent arbitral seat. And, and I think time will tell uh, as to how, you know, pr probably in the future, cases with a certain similarity with the factual matrix of the Chubb and uh, Halliburton and Chubb case, will also be determined and have the same outcome, which I think uh, is, is, is pretty arguable. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Robert, Robert B. Yes, uh, well, I respectfully disagree with the outcome. Um, uh, and my disagreement focuses very much on a point that Hillary and Gary touched on, but my disagreement with the decision as to what the timing is of when the infraction should be measured is 
quite more specific than that. And that is that the court looks to section 24 of the Arbitration Act and the word quote unquote exist there to say that that must mean that the grounds for challenge must exist at the time of the hearing. But when one looks at uh, section 24, it says that a party may apply to remove on the grounds listed there if they exist. Now, if the party may apply to the court for grounds that exist, then it must mean as a matter of statutory construction that the party at that point of the application must be able to ascertain whether or not, quote unquote, those grounds exist. It is not possible for a party to apply on the basis of grounds that exist. If exists means at the end of the lawsuit to which the application is going to lead. So as a matter of statutory construction, I find that incomprehensible. Um, and I find it incomprehensible that you may have grounds that allow you to apply, but that somehow a later event then completely negates uh, that power to apply, an event that is not known and could not have been known to the parties at the, at the point of application. Um, is it helpful uh, for London or not? Uh, there are many things that recommend London as a seat of arbitration. I would say this judgment isn't one of them in my mind for a very specific reason, in addition to what I just outlined. The judgment which will be read across the world gives great exposition to an arbitrator who time up and time and again gets appointed by a particular insurance company. And the justification for that sort of what I call monstrum is that insurance companies or other uh, corporate parties must be able to access people with knowledge, specific knowledge of their field. I don't think that follows at all. There are plenty of people in London, plenty of highly qualified arbitrators who are knowledgeable in numerous fields. It is not a justification to reappoint somebody, not once, twice, three, four, five, six times, and go on. And the fact that somebody's practice is to that extent dependent on a particular appointment to my mind, and I'm sure to the mind of many people across the world, raises grave concerns about the Institute of the Party Appointed Arbitrator. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's interesting to wonder whether the result would have been different if the arbitration in question had been John or Joanna Smith rather than Ken Rokerson. Um, but, but there we are. Um, we've, we're running out of time, I'm afraid, so I think we should pass over the last question, which is a rather more difficult question and not of immediate relevance to parties to arbitrations. Uh, we have a whole list of uh, questions from people who have been attending this webinar. Uh, let me just read one. Sora Rabi asked whether the non-observance of the duty of disclosure should automatically lead to the disqualification of the arbitrator concerned and his or her removal or recusal. Well, the decision of the Supreme Court was no, but I think the majority of our panel uh, if not all of them, consider that the Supreme Court applied too lax a test, too tolerant a test to uh, the question of the effect of the breach of the duty of disclosure. And it should normally lead to disqualification. And that's my impression of the contributions we've received from our very experienced eminent panel today. And perhaps I, I would have to, I would have to dissent from that. Um, the, I, I, I agree with the Supreme Court and also the IVA guidelines in saying that a failure to disclose um, isn't necessarily or even ordinarily a basis for, for removal, inadvertence, um, misreading of the IVA guidelines, other factors um, can, can easily lead to a non-disclosure that does not rise to the more significant level of a lack of independence and impartiality. I think I would agree with Gary on that. It must depend on the circumstances. Whether in the facts of this case is right is a separate question. I second that. 
right? So, okay, well, perhaps I overstated the reaction uh, of, uh, of the panel. Um, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, we've slightly run over our time, but that's the way things go. Let me thank Kawa again for organising this very, very helpful, quite excellent webinar. Kawa, is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Thank you very much, Stanley. We've had more than 300 participants. There's been a very interesting uh, cross-section of views that has been shared with us. And I'm very grateful to all the panelists for taking the time. And I just want to thank everybody for participating. It's obviously a very important judgment and its ramifications will be felt for some time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Have a good day. Stay well. Thank you all and be well. Thank you.